Many times, I have found myself in a difficult spot because of what I say. I find myself in trouble, not because I said anything wrong, but rather because I said something that is difficult to prove. In such cases, I am usually left with two options, either to explain what I said or run. Oftentimes, I choose to run away because it is easy. That is a dilemma you have to deal with whenever you share revelations that you receive while praying in tongues. Some of the revelations are basic knowledge that everyone agrees with. However, others are a bit deep. Just like any other person, I was never born receiving revelations. I had to learn how to receive revelations and verify that they are actually revelations from God. For the simple revelations, one or two scriptures will usually confirm them. But for the deep revelations, it takes more than a few scriptures to verify them. Today, I'll explain to you how I verify those deep revelations and how you can verify them as well. This is an important step in learning to receive revelations when you are praying in tongues. If you don't know how to verify revelations, God will refrain from giving you revelations so that you don't get confused. But if you know how to verify revelations, God will have no problem revealing revelations to you. I'll use a real example of a revelation to help you understand better. Recently, I was thinking of a video to make. While in the process of formulating my thoughts, I remembered a scripture that had been on my mind lately. Eventually, I decided to make a video about a revelation I had received regarding that scripture. The scripture was from the book of 2 Kings chapter 5. It was the story of Elisha healing Naaman of leprosy. But even before I began making the video, I knew there was a lot of information to share which I would not be able to capture in the short video. As a result, I decided to compress the information and bring out the main point. But while doing that, I knew it might leave a number of people questioning how I got to the conclusion that I made. Sure enough, one of you raised that concern and I decided to make this second video to elaborate a few important things. The main concern was how I got to the conclusion that Elisha dying of sickness was a punishment for how he bragged about his ability to heal Naaman. Well, here are a few things you need to understand. One, God's nature is constant as Hebrews chapter 13 verse 8 tells us. God maintains a constant nature to make it easy for us to believe him. When it comes to God's nature, there are two main sides, his merciful nature and his judging nature. His merciful nature is described in one of my favorite scriptures, Psalms chapter 145 verse 8. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. His judging nature is described in many places, but the most important one is Psalms chapter 97 verse 2, where we are told righteousness and justice at the foundation of his throne. Anyone who claims to know God must acknowledge that God is both gracious and compassionate, but at the same time, he judges all creation to maintain righteousness and justice. Even the father of our faith, Abraham, knew this, as the book of Genesis chapter 18 verse 25 tells us. This is a fundamental principle in verifying revelations that you receive when you pray in tongues. Regardless of the nature of the revelation, it must portray the revealed nature of God. This brings me to the second point. How do you verify that a revelation aligns with God's nature. I'll use a practical example to show you. In the revelation I shared about Elisha dying of a sickness as punishment for bragging about his ability to heal Naaman, I only pointed out God's judging nature. God's judgment is always precise and very fair so that no one can accuse God of being unjust. In God's book, Every good deed must be rewarded, regardless of the person who did it, and every ungodly deed must be punished, regardless of the person who did it. However, things become a bit complex when you factor in God's merciful side. Because God is merciful, his punishment carries a measure of mercy equal to the measure of mercy that the offender shows to others. This is where the scriptures in the book of Matthew chapter 5 verse 7 and James chapter 2 verse 13 come in. If the offender shows 100% mercy to others, God will be obligated by his law to show the offender 100% mercy, which means he won't be punished. If the offender shows zero mercy for their victim, God is obligated to punish the offender with zero mercy, as it is the case with evil spirits that torment human beings with zero mercy. That way, God incorporates mercy in his judgment without perverting justice. This is also why Jesus told parables, like the one found in the book of Matthew chapter 18, 
from verse 21 to 35. Another very important point to note is that God prefers to punish righteous people for any wrongdoing while they are still alive so that when they die, they have no more punishment. For the wicked, God prefers to reward them for any good deed they do while they are still alive so that when they die, there is no more reward for them to claim from God. This explains why God is very strict in punishing any wrongdoing done by people he loves but goes easy on wicked people. At the same time, God prefers to withhold the reward of righteous people so that they have a great reward after they die, the same way he withholds the punishment of wicked people until after they die. In the case of Elisha, he was definitely a righteous man, but he exalted himself, which in God's law is punishable by humiliation. Because Elisha never pleaded for mercy for his wrongdoing, God was obligated to punish him. The humiliation was supposed to match the type of exaltation, the same way the exaltation of God always matches the humiliation that someone went through. In this case, the very sickness Elisha claimed he could heal would be the same sickness that would kill him. That was the judgment of God for what Elisha did, but equally, God showed great mercy to Elisha. First, God refrained from punishing Elisha immediately, which was supposed to be the case. God healed Naaman through Elisha so that Elisha would not be put to shame. Secondly, God chose to execute the punishment on Elisha at the end of his life so that it wouldn't be painful for Elisha because it was the end of his life anyway. If you are a keen reader of the Bible, you will notice that this is the same thing that God did with Moses. When Moses struck the rock instead of speaking to it, God set his punishment, but out of his mercy, God executed the punishment at the end of the life of Moses so that it wouldn't be very painful for Moses. In contrast, the other Israelites who disobeyed God died instantly in the wilderness. When the Holy Spirit reveals a revelation to you, he will only tell you the conclusion and leave you to seek for the explanation. If you accept his conclusion and begin seeking for his explanation, he will reveal to you how that conclusion comes about. If you reject the conclusion or demand for an explanation before accepting the conclusion, the Holy Spirit will not reveal any further information to you because you would have failed the humility test. As you can see, Trying to explain the revelation required me to quote many scriptures. That is exactly what happens with deeper revelations. They incorporate knowledge from many scriptures to make a simple conclusion. From the surface, the conclusion may look like speculation, but there are enough scriptures to back it up if you want to go that route. Lastly, take note that how quickly you believe a revelation comes down to your level of faith, which is a product of your knowledge of scriptures. To verify any revelation, check if it is consistent with God's nature. God bless you.